Well, it is with great joy, but also uh, a bittersweet moment for me to introduce Dan, who is a PhD student in my lab. I've actually known Dan for the last seven or almost eight years, since 2017, when Dan was an intern, a, a college intern at the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago when I was a postdoc there. Um, and Dan's job was to go through pictures and help people set up cameras. Um, and one thing that struck me about Dan is he had heard, I never talked to him, but he had heard that I did GIS uh, in my work. And so he came over and said he had just taken a class in college in GIS and he liked to get some practical skills. So asked if he could have a side project um, uh, with his internship. And so I said, sure, here's some data, collect these variables for me using GIS. And I was really impressed of that initiative of like a 19 year old coming up asking for, for extra work. So that was 2017, Dan went back to school, finished up school and came back to the Lincoln Park Zoo the next summer as a full-time into summer intern at the zoo and uh, became more close, like more friends with Dan. At that time, I was still there doing a lot of field work. At that time, I think he was now old enough to drink, so he came out to happy hours with the group. <laughs> so basically, I've known Dan uh, for a long time since his, he was like a wee 20-year-old undergrad mm -hmm. student. Um, so then Dan, after he finished that internship and had a couple of jobs in Minneapolis, moved to DC and was leading the DC Cat Count, which was a huge multi-million dollar effort by the Humane Rescue Alliance and, George, and not Georgetown, the Smithsonian at the time, Pete Morrow. And they put cameras out at over like 1,500 sites in DC, trying to manage the, the cat, or trying to get an estimate of the cat population. So that's how D Dan landed in DC. I came about a year later when Dan found out I was in DC. Uh, he let me know that he wanted to try to go to grad school and wanted to go get his PhD. And so we started scheming a little bit then. He was still working for the cat count. Fun fact is we kind of figured out a way that Dan could maybe go to grad school. This is when I was at George Mason. So we met at Brooklyn Pint to have a beer and talk about this. And at that moment while we were meeting, I got a text message from George Mason that we would not be coming back for spring break because we were going to be home for COVID. So Dan was actually the last person besides my wife who I had a drink with and had a personal <laughs> like, experience with before we all went into our home bunkers for, for COVID. Um, so that's a fun fact. So Dan started at George Mason with me in 2020 um, and graciously and, and thankfully moved over here to Maryland with me and went through that transition. Um, so I also appreciate his flexibility and grace as we, as we transitioned over uh, to Maryland. And now here we are. So that's sort of my personal story about Dan, um, not only a PhD student in my, in my lab, but a, a good friend for the last seven years. Um, so I need to use my notes. So I do have a list of accolades for Dan to make this announcement. Dan was twice honorable mention for the NSF GRFP, also an honorable mention for Nat Geo Explorer Fellowship. At George Mason, he received a Mason Corps Teaching Excellent Award. He was also got the best graduate presentation at the Virginia Wildlife Society meeting in 2021. Honorable mention for Outstanding Graduate Student Award at the Delaware, Maryland Wildlife Society meeting. Just recently, he also got the Dean's Fellowship Award here uh, for AGNR. Dan has, uh, since started his PhD, he has 17 publications, which eight of them are, co are first author papers. So he has been quite productive on side projects outside of his um, dissertation. And so with that, I'm happy to introduce Dan, who will be talking about what he is, his dissertation research. Hmm. Recording. Thank you, Travis. Uh, I believe we're recording. We're good. Yeah. Okay. A Tale of Two Cities. Did you read the book? Do you remember it? Allow me to jog your memory. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Infamous opening lines to Charles Dickens' classic novel describing the French Revolution. Thrilling story of love, sacrifice, and revenge. And in the book, Dickens relies on juxtaposition to paint his story. The rich against the poor, the aristocrat, and the bourgeoisie. He describes two different ways of life so different from each other that they are essentially unreconcilable. For all intents and purposes, he describes two different cities within the same great walls. One that rests on the shoulders of the laborers, and the other that is supported by the divine providence of the ruling class. Two conceptual cities in one place. Now, of course, Paris is Paris, no matter how much money you have. It's not really two different cities. Members from either political class are codependent, even if those relationships are lopsided. But as humans, we feel psychologically safe when we can use a framework to understand reality. And one of our oldest frameworks is to dichotomize sources of power. 
good versus evil, us versus them. We have a similar dichotomy of power in ecology, and that is eco ecological regulation by uh, bottom up and top down pressures, where bottom up forces come from plants and abiotic factors, top down forces come from predation. An even older duality in ecology is the time honored tradition of trying to cognitively separate humans from nature. But like the two cities that together make up Paris, drawing a line to separate components of a spectrum presents issues. Especially when you look at it on a gradient, it's hard to really know where can you draw a line. Despite that difficulty, we draw lines anyways. And we use these arbitrary groups to mentally separate components of the world around us. But what happens if something moves from one area to another? Say, for example, a squirrel starts eating from your bird feeder, and then it takes up residence in your attic. That's not natural. Is the squirrel part of nature anymore? If a fox eats a squirrel, does it also cease to be part of nature? In reality, humans and wildlife form these nested, complex, and adaptive feedback loops that not only shape our future environment, but narrow our potential future decisions and consequences. And on top of that, our sociodemographics can change the, the intensity of these relationships, further altering feedback loops and blurring that human natural line even further. Because in truth, humans, nature, and ecosystem regulation are intrinsically intertwined. And that's the argument I'll present today over the next four chapters. The line between bottom-up and top-down regulation is blurry at best, and humans have a hand in all of it. It's keeping ecosystems from being completely either natural or anthropogenic. So we'll start in chapter two by looking at the relationship between urban park systems and avian assemblages. In chapter three, we'll discuss the role of abiotic factors in predator-prey dynamics. Then in chapter four, we'll examine how habitat characteristics can facilitate predation. And then finally, we'll finish up in chapter five, exploring how human actions amplify predation in urban systems. And so we'll dive in with chapter two. And this is an urban wildlife talk, so we're going to start with the philosophical question of what is urban wildlife, or more specifically, what makes an urban bird? Now, research tells us that there are certain traits that kind of predispose some species to do well in urban areas. Uh, for example, dispersal ability. So if a bird is able to fly from patch to patch, park to park, it might do better than another species that is kind of limited to one spot. Likewise, dietary breath. If a bird is able to eat a lot of different things, it might do better in an urban area than a specialist. But this trait-centric approach ignores half the picture, because it's not traits themselves that dictate how successful a species is. Rather, it's a relationship between these traits and the environment that determines that species' success. That is, different environmental features come together to create hyper-specific place-based filters that allow some species to do quite well, but exclude other species altogether. And traditionally, a landscape would change in a fairly predictable way through ecological succession, and we would be able to uh, predict what resources, what niches will become available in the future, and that would allow us to understand and predict ahead of time what birds will be here, what, what will our faunal community look like. But in urban areas, human decisions, rather than natural processes, tend to dictate the vegetative community. And whether we realize it or not, humans create location-specific filters for species through our unique patterns of land use and development. So the question then becomes, how can we build cities that filter out as few species as possible. Of course, these filters, they don't form overnight. They, just like ecological succession, are the product of what has come before it. And so similar to succession, we can use these trajectories to try to understand what communities are here today and what will be here in the future. And so for this chapter, I asked two research questions. One, how do historical patterns of urban development shape species assemblages? And two, how do landscape metrics influence species from various functional groups differently? So to investigate this, I took a longitudinal lens looking at three different cities, Washington, DC, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There are three roughly similarly aged, similarly sized cities. Uh, they all experience winter. They all have at least one river, but they're not on a coast. And importantly for this project, they all have very different park systems and they all have bird data that goes back to about 1900, thanks to the Audubon Christmas bird count. Now, the Christmas bird count is an annual survey every December. It's a citizen science project. People go outside and they count how many birds and what species they are. And this has been going on since the year 1900. And so I was able to take those data and calculate a number of community metrics, including species richness, species diversity, functional richness, functional diversity, 
and the number of observations of birds from different functional species. So I took those metrics and plugged it into our model. Uh, I also used Chris's bird count data to uh, account for varying survey effort across the years. As we know, when there are more people out there looking, we're going to see more species. And so we control for that using uh, the, the Chris's bird count data as well. Similarly, controlling for what's going on outside of the park system, because a city isn't just the park, uh, we pulled, or I pulled historic census data as a proxy for development around the city. I also looked at archived weather data to see are some winters cooler or warmer, and is that driving the changes that we see? And then I also included time, which is kind of a strange variable, but think about it. If you make a park today and you plant a bunch of trees, it's not going to be habitat tomorrow. It's going to take a little bit of time to mature. And so we account for that by including time as a variable here uh, to account for that maturation. And then finally, because I recognize that these cities, although I tried to keep them pretty similar, they are inherently different places. And so I use a random intercept for each city so that the relationships between our dependent and independent variables can be the same across cities, but we can have different starting points. So that's all the variables that we're kind of controlling for, trying to see what's going on in the background. But the stuff we're really interested in here is how do changes in the park systems over time influence our uh, avian communities? And getting those data was not quite as easy. So that involved several years of going to libraries and museums and archives and wading through really old maps and trying to explain to librarians why I wanted to be in the map library. And once I got those maps, I imported them into ArcGIS, where I manually traced the uh, green spaces in the city, which included parks, cemeteries, and eventually golf courses. These polygons were then rasterized, and I used those rasters to calculate several landscape metrics uh, for each city for each time period. And those included the percent of the city made up by park, the mean edge interior ratio of the parks, which is a metric of how convoluted the shape is. And then we also looked at the clumpiness index of the park, which is an aggregation index where really high numbers indicate that the parks are uh, aggregated and low values indicate dispersion. And so when you put all the maps together, you see that the parks do change over time. It's not a static system. So in these maps, the darker polygons indicate parks that were there uh, older in time, and then the lighter the polygon gets, that the newer the park is. And so you might notice Minneapolis in the middle and Pittsburgh on the right more or less kind of have two colors. There's a dark and a light. There's not really much in the middle. And so they had really two big pushes for park development. Whereas in DC on the far left, we tend to see a little bit more of a gradient. And so the addition of parks over time is a little bit more constant. And if we look at how these changes in the park system influence the avian community, I found that park area was the only landscape metric that actually had a significant relationship with any of our bird metrics. So on all of these plots, percent of green space area, percent of the city that was green space is on the X axis. On the far left, we have species richness on the Y. You can see that as we add park to the city, uh, we see more species of birds. If you look in the middle plot, we have uh, species diversity on the Y axis. And we see that as green space increases, diversity declines, even though species richness increases. Now recall that diversity includes richness and uh, evenness. And so if you're adding just one individual of these different species, that is an increase in richness, but not necessarily in evenness. So that's why we see a negative uh, relationship there. On the far right, we have functional diversity on the y-axis, and we go back to a positive relationship. So as we have more park space, uh, we have greater functional diversity. Now, we also looked at the number of observations of birds from different trait groups here. Um, and so this, the results on the screen here are for dispersal ability. So the gray beta values in the plots, that's the effect size of that landscape variable on the number of observations of birds of that functional group. The colored betas estimates here below the photos indicate uh, the effect size of having a trait that is either lower than average or above average. So in this case, this kind of green color uh, is the effect of having a small home range on the number of birds you see, whereas the red color is the effect of having a larger than average home range on the number of birds you see. And so if you'll recall kind of from the introduction here, having a, a wide dispersal capacity tends to help species survive in urban areas. That's what we've always been told. That's what the research has always found. But this study found that actually the effect of increased park area is a larger effect than the trait of having a high dispersal capacity. And it's a similar story with dietary breadth. Even though dietary generalism, uh, we tend to believe, helps species survive in cities better, 
uh, the effect of having a wide diet is still smaller than the effect of green space. And so this supports the idea that it is the interaction between the trait and the landscape, not just the species traits alone, that allows some species to do well in cities and excludes other species. And additionally, I found that as cities increase their park space, we see greater species richness, functional diversity, and increased observations of individuals regardless of their functional trait. But the same relationships do not exist for the other landscape metrics. Remember, those were edge interior ratio and clumpiness. And so what that tells me is that since our strongest response was to park space, urban planners should be focusing on adding parks to cities even when they aren't pristine or ideal. Because even a bad park, like the one shown on the right, overrun with English ivy and transected by this rusty chain link fence, is still a park and it still offers habitat. And these results suggest that the avian community benefits from any additional green space we can afford them. So bringing that back to my central argument here, it's clear that habitat availability constructs the avian community in cities, making a notably bottom up argument. But human decisions and culture dictate the shape, size, and distribution of parks across the city, shedding light on the human-driven and top-down aspect of this phenomenon. And speaking of shedding light, that brings us nicely to chapter three. Mm -hmm. So now we've covered how our actions impact the species on uh, present in cities, but I'm also curious about how our actions impact the day-to-day -day behavior of our wild neighbors, such as anti-predator behavior. Now, prey adopt anti-predator behaviors when predators are near like vigilance behavior or forming a large foraging group. And since some places and, and times are riskier than others, these behaviors are not uniformly practiced across the landscape. And ecologists call this variation the landscape of fear. We've already discussed that humans shape the physical landscape and how that can change the species present. And one outcome of human development is that it often deters large predators from being there. And as a result, predation pressure is lifted from many of the prey species and we see the landscape of fear changes drastically. But we still do see some moderate level of anti-predator behavior, despite the fact that the predators are no longer really here. And I was curious as to why that is. And I thought, surely, perhaps it could be because humans are around and maybe we're perceived as predators to the deer. But if there's a shrub or a bush or something that deer can hide behind and mediate that risk, uh, I was curious, would they stop being as vigilant? Is that enough to protect them? If that does have an effect, it's not going to hold up all year round in temperate climates, the leaves fall and we're back to the same vulnerable position. We also, even though that's a seasonal change, we know that there are changes that happen on a much finer temporal scale. Like every night it gets dark and maybe the lack of light makes it harder for some species to be able to see an incoming threat. And so they're a little bit more vigilant in that time. Or likewise, maybe if it's really loud and they can't rely on auditory cues, maybe that prompts anti-predator behavior. And so my questions here broadly is how do disturbance from humans, ambient light and ambient noise impact vigilance behavior and foraging group size in white-tailed deer? And to answer this question, I use the uh, camera trapping network from the Urban Nature Lab. We've run about 75 cameras across the DMV. We put them out for at least one month, uh, four times a year, every spring, summer, fall, and winter. I also put out some acoustic recording devices to record noise levels. Um, we did not have 75 of those, so we're a little bit limited. And so I took a uh, random stratified sample of our sites. And so the sites that are highlighted here in red are the sites that uh, we ended up using in this study. And I want to show just a subset of three of these sites to give you an idea of the variation that occurs. You can see that light, noise, and sound all vary between sites, seasons, and even time of day. Likewise, you can see that the vegetative structure surrounding each camera varies. And so all this variation allows us a, a good opportunity to test these hypotheses uh, and be able to see what are the factors influencing this behavior. So at each of these sites, I put out a camera and an acoustic recording device. We worked with the uh, manufacturer of the camera to alter the cameras to record light level. And so we we're able to take these light recordings as well. And then back in the lab, took a look at the photos and I coded each deer as either being vigilant or non-vigilant. So vigilant is when it holds its head up above the body, non-vigilant, its head is below the body. Imagine the last time you were walking in a park and you saw a deer and it shot its head up and it made eye contact with you, that's vigilant behavior. But if you see a deer off in the distance and it's just grazing, that's non-vigilant behavior. So the position of the head is what tells us that. And I also counted how many individuals were in each photo and that's what we used as uh, the, the group size or the foraging group size in this model. 
So I plugged all that data into this model, uh, but to quantify the risk of running into humans, I had to get a little bit more creative. I used hourly cell phone tracking data to get a sense of how many people were within one deer home range of each camera site during a given hour. But I allowed habitat openness to mediate the pressure of humans. And to define habitat openness, uh, I use one minus the normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI, which is a, a metric of vegetative intensity, divided by habitat rumple, which is a metric of habitat complexity. And because of the inherent bounds of these metrics and the structure of our openness equation, we always achieve an openness value that's bounded between either zero or one. As a result, if openness is low, meaning that it's a very complex habitat, there's a lot of places to hide, we get a low openness value that reduces the effect of humans in our model. If openness is high, that is, there are few places to hide, we bear the full brunt of humans in the model, and so we get uh, a stronger impact from that. So enough about the methods, let's dive into the results of this. The graphs on screen here are for vigilance behavior. So on the y-axis, we have the probability of vigilant behavior. And on the plot on the left, we have light level on the x-axis. You can see as we get lighter, the light is more intense, uh, deer show less vigilance behavior, that probability declines. But it's the opposite relationship for sound, which is the graph on the right. If you look at the x-axis, we have sound pressure on the y, we still have probability of vigilance. And as we get noisier, deer are more likely to express vigilant behavior. Interestingly, relative risk of encountering humans was insignificant, had no relationship with vigilance behavior. And it was a similar story when it came to group size. Uh, actually, the only variable that was significant for this one was sound level, and which is on the x-axis here. And you can see that as the environment gets noisier, deer tend to congregate into larger groups together. And so these findings are especially fascinating, especially when you recall that we don't have any resident large predators in our region. And our model suggests that deer don't find us intimidating. And so if there's no predators and they're not afraid of us, you have to ask, what are they scared of? And my results indicate that maybe these anti-predator behaviors aren't driven by predators themselves, but are instead driven by the inability to detect a predator in the first place. That is a dark and noisy condition that limits a deer's perception of the environment, make it difficult to know for sure if there's a predator about to pounce. And that uncertainty presents a much larger threat than a couple of humans walking through the woods. So in summary, urban deer adjust their behavior based on their ability to detect a predator, not necessarily on predators themselves. And this turns the landscape of fear concept on its head, because historically it was assumed that predators were the one and only factor that contributed to the landscape of fear. But here I show that this traditionally top-down concept has a very wide bottom-up base. Thus, anti-predator behavior is nestled between top-down and bottom-up forces. And if I may be so bold, I'd like to propose that we shift how we think of this phenomenon and consider anti-predator responses as a middle-out factor since this behavior is reliant on pressures from above and below it. And so here we have an interesting case that flips conventional ecology on its head. The landscape of fear isn't driven by predators themselves, but by environmental conditions. Accordingly, it rests on a gradient between bottom-up and top-down regulation, and it cannot be fully claimed by either category. And of course, we as humans are also contributing to this regularly with noise pollution and light pollution, once again, entangling ourselves into a traditionally natural concept of predator-prey dynamics. And we're going to continue with this theme of predator-prey dynamics into chapter four, which explores the potential for predation of native wildlife by free-roaming domestic cats. So you're sitting here thinking, cats, I thought this was about wildlife. Why are we talking about cats? And the reason is because whenever a cat goes outside, there's a large potential for a negative outcome. And that's to both cats and wildlife and human public health. So if we look at threats to wildlife, there's always a threat of uh, disease transmission from cats to wildlife, but also the threat of predation. Cats are prolific predators. They are responsible for 63 extinctions globally. But even when they're not directly preying on animals, just their presence alone can be enough to have non-consumptive effects that lead to mortality. Several studies have documented just the cat being in the area causes uh, mothers to abandon their young, abandon the nest, and those chicks will die just as, a, just as a result of the cat being out, so even if the cat's not preying on them directly. But this risk goes the opposite direction as well. Wildlife, of course, can also give cats parasites and diseases and viruses. It can also prey on cats and rough them up. 
course, a cat, when it goes outside, has the possibility of getting hit by a car, and that hopefully doesn't happen in your living room. And also, when cats go outdoors, they run the risk of consuming poison, either directly or by consuming a rat which has eaten poison in an alley or from a, one of those old rat bait boxes. And so as you can see, there are many reasons why cats should be kept indoors for their own benefit and for the benefit of wildlife. But for the purpose of these next two chapters, I'm only going to talk about the potential transfer of zoonotic disease and the potential for predation. Now, in order for predation to take place, predator and prey need to be in the same place at the same time. That said, we can see which species have the highest risk of coming into contact by analyzing how their spatial distributions overlap and seeing how similar their active periods are. And so for this chapter, I asked, to what extent do free roaming domestic cats co-occur with wildlife across Washington, DC? And to what extent do cats and wildlife have overlapping activity patterns? You'll recall in a previous chapter, I used the Urban Nature Lab or Urban Wildlife Information Network camera array. But for these next chapters, I actually used a different array uh, from the DC Cat Count Project, which was a much higher density camera array, but was geographically restricted to Washington proper. And because animals make decisions at different spatial scales, I ran this analysis at three different scales by superimposing grids of different sizes over the city, and then taking all the cameras that fell within each grid and combining them to make grid cell specific detection histories. And then put this into an occupancy model to understand spatial overlap, considering canopy cover, the availability of open water, vehicular traffic, human population density, and average neighborhood income as variables that might influence whether an animal is there or not. And the really cool thing about occupancy models is that in addition to predicting where animals are distributed on the landscape, they can also account for cases of imperfect detection, which happens when an animal is present, but we don't see it in our survey. Maybe we set the camera up facing one way and the cat walks around the tree and it goes undetected. And so our model is able to account for that. And the variables I use to try to get to explain the, the detection and probability is the number of cameras within a grid cell. We're back to that survey effort thing again, trying to control for greater survey efforts, going to see things more. Whether there was fog that day or rain that day, the average daily temperature, as well as the lunar phase that night. And because I work in a Bayesian framework, when I predicted occupancy across the landscape, each one of these little grid cells has its own posterior distribution of estimated species occupancy. So I can take the posterior for cats and multiply it by the posterior for a given species of wildlife. And what we arrive at is a joint probability of occupancy, which I interpret as the probability of the two species overlapping in space. Separately, I used kernel density as a photo timestamps to find patterns in species activity and to calculate the degree to which species activity overlaps. And while I did this uh, for eight different species of native wildlife, for the sake of time, I'm only going to discuss the results uh, for four of them, two vector species and two prey species. But before I get there, I want to discuss briefly kind of how to interpret this. Uh, we have our three different spatial scales in the maps. Underneath each map is a list of abbreviations. Each one of those corresponds to the variable that was, or to a variable that was significant with it, and they're in order of magnitude. So that first abbreviation, that first letter represents the strongest variable, the second one is the second strongest, and so on. There's a negative sign, it's a negative relationship, positive sign indicates a positive relationship. And then uh, within the map, the closer to yellow it gets, or the warmer colors, indicates a higher probability of occupancy. The cooler it gets, the lower the probability of occupancy. In the temporal figure here, uh, you see kind of this circle on a 24-hour clock where the circle gets really dense and kind of has a peak or a mountain. That's an, a time where there's a lot of activity and where there's a valley or a trough there's less activity from the species in that time period. The vertical line there shows the average active time. And you might note that for cats, uh, which is the results that we have on the screen here, it's kind of homogenous across a 24 hour clock. They're active all day long. And so the average time of activity comes out as midnight. It's not very meaningful. That's gonna be a little bit more meaningful as we move forward and we see the average activity time in some of the wildlife species. So we've already talked about kind of how the, the cats are active as a species 24 hours a day, but let's talk about the uh, occupancy probability. Cats had a negative relationship with both water and canopy cover. Also had a negative relationship with neighborhood income, but a positive relationship with population density. And so before I get ahead of myself, we see them most in the urban core, 
uh, but we don't see them much around the Anacostia or the Potomac. Um, we don't see them a ton in Rock Creek or these large green spaces. And especially at the smaller scale, we don't see them in the northwest section of the city. And so going forward, looking at the overlap, we now have six maps. The three on top are for the species of interest. The three on bottom represent the overlap between cats and that species. And in the temporal plot, the dark blue portion of that polygon shows activity overlap between those two species active periods. And so we see here that uh, for eastern chipmunks, they're diurnal, they're active during the day, um, but their entire active time it overlaps that of cats because cats are also active all day long. We do see a positive relationship between chipmunk occupancy and canopy cover and neighborhood income. So that as a result, they're most probable in the northwestern portion of the city. Uh, we don't see a ton of cats there, and so the probability of overlap is actually relatively low for this species, setting the stage for an altogether low probability of predation. But we see a different story uh, with groundhogs. Groundhogs had a negative relationship with income and population density, and they are most probably seen uh, east of the Anacostia. We see a lot of cats in wards 7 and 8, and so there's a decent probability of spatial overlap between cats and groundhogs in D.C. And just like chipmunks, groundhogs are active during the day and their entire active period overlaps that of cats. I'm going to move on to uh, vector species now. Uh, red foxes had a positive relationship with canopy cover and water and a negative relationship with human population density. As a result, they have a relatively high occupancy across the city except for that urban core. Uh, so they also have a relatively high overlap with cats, especially on the fringes of the city. They do shift, they're different from the prey species in that they're active at night, and you see, again, the entire active range overlaps. Raccoons even more so but with overlap, they have a positive association with canopy cover and water and a negative association with population and income. And they have a very high probability of occurring across the city, resulting in a very high probability of co-occurring with cats. Once again, that active period overlaps. And so cats and wildlife have a high but variable spatial overlap and cats are active around the clock at the species level. So have consistently high temporal overlap with wildlife. Now on top of that, I found cats to be distributed based on human population density and neighborhood income. They shy away from large forested areas or lots of water, indicating that their distribution is heavily influenced by anthropogenic factors. In other words, humans dictate the distribution of cats on the landscape. They are an inherently anthropogenic problem. That's not all bad because if humans are the problem, we are also the solution. By enforcing policies that limit the overlap between cats and wildlife, we can vastly reduce the chances for zoonotic disease transmission and predation, which ultimately protects cats, wildlife, and humans alike. And so here, both habitat availability, which is a bottom-up factor, and presence of humans, which is a top-down factor, jointly contribute to the distribution and overlap of cats and wildlife, which in turn further contributes to top-down pressures since this overlap allows for predation to take place. Once again, this study melds the top-down and bottom-up influences and implicates humans. However, this study uses overlap as a proxy for predation. We don't analyze predation behavior directly. And for that, we move to the fifth and final chapter of the dissertation. So you may remember from the map of the DC Cat Cop cameras, there were tons of cameras, over 1,500 of them. We brought in over 6 million photographs and reviewed each one of them. And some of them actually documented predation behavior. And so this was great because this allows a record of who was predating what, where, and when. So total, there were 97 predation events that we recorded. 77% of them were from cats. And I started looking at the numbers and realized that the most common species that cats were eating were non-native. So from a conservation standpoint, uh, I mean, is it the end of the world? if? Rats are being eaten in the alleys? No, it's not. But cats are still eating some native species. And I wanted to understand why. What's, the, what's driving the selection of the prey that they're eating? These rats sometimes and native species other times. And so the variable or the questions that I asked were, what are the variables that predict predation of wildlife by cats? And how do predation patterns differ between native and non-native prey species? And I wanted to use the answers of these questions to inform management decisions that would reduce uh, predation of native species. So I used information from the photographs to plug into our model uh, to tell if there was a predation that took place to assess if a cat had been spayed or neutered um, because often advocates of free domestic cats will say if you sterilize a cat that takes away its instinct to hunt 
There's no data behind that. It's just a claim that's made. And so we wanted to test that. And so we put that in our model. Uh, and then also accounted for uh, just the number of cat observations we saw at any camera, because if you have 10 cats at one camera and a million at another, you're just so much more likely to see any behavior at the camera with a million photos. And so we're trying to account for that by using uh, the number of cats at a camera as an offset term. I then used remotely sensed data to inform the distance to a forest edge and the amount of impervious surface, uh, both of which are metrics that quantify the degree of urbanization at a site. And then another claim that is often made is that if you feed your cats, they'll be full, they won't want to go hunt, they don't need to go hunt, and so they'll stop killing wildlife. Again, there's not really much data that backs us up, and so I wanted to test this as well. But as you can imagine, there is no database of where there's cat food across the city. And so I was very <laughs> fortunate that this was a uh, multidisciplinary project, and our social science team had done a survey asking cat owners, do you put cat food out? And so we had this data across the city, and I was able to estimate a citywide variable of cat food availability. I plugged this all into the model, uh, looking at just the number of predation events that occurred, and the three top variables that come out as significant were the density of cat food, the distance to a forest edge, and whether or not a cat had been sterilized. So on the left, we have cat food density on the x-axis, number of predation events on the y. And so you see that as we increase the amount of cat food on the landscape, we see an increase in predation behavior. On the plot on the right, we have distance to forest edge on the x-axis, x -axis, and number of predation events on the y. And we see that as you move further away from the forest, predation declines. And you'll notice in both graphs, you have two different colors. Uh, one is for sterilized cats and the other is for non-sterilized cats. And although this did come out as a significant variable, note that the confidence intervals overlap each other across the entire gradient of our variables. So in reality, they're not functionally different. They're still predating at the same uh, amount as one another. So it's not making an actual difference. But let's go back to that first result. I saw a few of you kind of scratching your heads there. Paradoxically, humans increase cat predation rates by leaving cat food out. Kind of a weird result. But actually, it makes sense if you think about it from a resource availability standpoint. Cats are territorial animals and will defend their home ranges to ensure they have exclusive access to local resources. And in the absence of supplemental food, that territory needs to be large enough to provide consistent nourishment. But if you add food to the landscape, that territoriality decreases. They don't need to patrol as far to get that food because it's always there and it's always more than they need. As a result, the landscape can then sustain more cats than it otherwise would have been able to. So while feeding a cat may very well reduce the individual predation rate, it will actually amplify the population level predation rate because it allows more predators to be on the landscape. So this is good information to tell us about specifically where predation rates are increasing, but I'm interested especially in what the prey species is. Is it native or not? So I refit the model with a logistic regression to see the probability of a prey species being native and found that distance to forest edge was the top predictor. So here you have distance to forest edge on the x-axis and you see as you move away from the forest, you see the probability of the prey being native declines. So mapped across the city, we can see that predation of native species is pretty much concentrated in these forested patches. And from a management standpoint, this is great news because we can pick some probability threshold and use that to formulate a buffer zone, a cat exclusionary zone for management that says no cats here, we're saving the wildlife. But what probability threshold would we want to select? Here's a couple examples of what we could do. On the far left is a 50% probability. And when we, if we put that into place, we'd be saying we're okay with a 50-50 chance that any animal the cat takes, it's either native or non-native. It's a toss up. The opposite end of the spectrum, on the far right, that buffer zone shown in red would say if we kept cats out of this area as a management practice, we would almost never see native species be predated by cats. But again, which one of these do we pick? Is, it seems kind of arbitrary just to select a threshold. Is there a more data-driven way that we can use to approach this? And for that, I ran the same analysis, but this time I looked at the probability of prey being a non-native brown rat. And once again, distance to forest edge comes out as a top predictor. So this time, as we move away from the forest, the probability of the prey being a rat increases. And when we consider that in conjunction with those previous results, we see the results are quite eloquent. At about 250 meters from the forest edge, the probability of prey being native is about 25% or well below chance. 
Also at that distance from the forest edge, the probability of the prey being a rat surpasses that of the probability being native. And so these results suggest that a 250 meter buffer shown here in red or on the green forest would be an adequate management strategy to significantly reduce the amount of predation by, of native species by domestic cats. So relating it back to the central theme of the day, habitat availability is a key determinant of how much predation occurs and which species are falling prey. Again, introducing a bottom-up component into a traditionally top-down narrative of predator-prey dynamics. And on top of that, humans amplify predation rates by releasing and feeding cats on the landscape uh, when they would otherwise not be there. And so I've shown this slide a few times and I've gone back and forth throwing bottom up at top down and, and vice versa. And if you're sitting there with your head spinning trying to work out what's natural and what's anthropogenic, what's top down and what's bottom up, allow me to save you the trouble. In reality, the lines between these categories are fuzzy at best. And by dichotomizing them, we really limit our understanding of ecological phenomena and lose the nuanced ties between ourselves and our non-human neighbors. So when you think about urban ecosystems, don't get caught up in trying to tease apart uh, what direction the regulation is coming from, because it's never just the habitat or just the buildings or just the cars or just the predators that shape our ecosystems. We live in interconnected socio-ecological systems that transcend such dualities. In other words, tales of two cities no longer. With that, I want to acknowledge, um, I'll get to acknowledgments of the lab in a minute, but I want to acknowledge the Anacostan, Piscataway, Powhatan, Dakota, Ojibwe, Shawnee, Lenape, and all other indigenous people that lived peacefully in my study cities before being forcefully removed or executed. And I similarly want to acknowledge the many enslaved, indentured, or otherwise marginalized people that physically built these cities from the ground up. I think it's really important to remember our troubled past so we can always move forward together to a more perfect future. And so please keep these people in mind, honor them in your own way, and always work towards a better place for all people. I want to also thank my lab, especially my advisor, Dr. Travis Gallo, uh, and all the um, my incredible lab mates and collaborators over the years, all the different research institutions that I've had the opportunity to work alongside. And of course, I'd like to thank you. And if I have time, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah. All right. First off, I love the whole philosophical bent from the beginning about you know embracing the fuzziness because uh, I think that's one way that's that's one way I took what you were what you were talking mm -hmm. about there. Embrace the the complexity and the fuzziness and stop trying to put everything in a box. Um, I think that applies to a lot of different science areas. So the one one idea that I had about the relationship that you see with cat predation with like, you know, and, and setting out food for mm -hmm. cats basically. Could it also be that the food is like also baiting some of the, the prey for the cats? Uh, it very well could be. Um, and it, depending on the prey species, I think, you know, like if uh, the native species that cats are going after tend to be um, not even so much omnivorous, but mostly vegetarian, herbivorous. And so cat food often is just pate. Mm -hmm. And so that meat isn't necessarily going to draw a chipmunk in, um, but it might be drawing in rats or you know things of that nature that then could be setting up a trap for them. Yeah. Yeah. Really great presentation. I have so many questions. <laughs> Thank um, you. So just because you're spurred thought, not that you didn't you know address things properly. Um, one question is with the deer. I mean, deer in DC, we are their only predator, right? Mm -hmm. So is there any other predator for the deer in any of the places, like in the three places you looked at, aren't we the only ones? Do we, or do we have a natural deer predator here versus in Yellowstone or something? Sure. Yeah, by and large, we are the main threat. Um, coyotes will kill fawns. So they are a threat in the spring, but not really the rest of the year. Um, and occasionally we have black bears that come down here, um, but they're kind of few and far between. So pretty much by and large, we're the only predator, which is why I was kind of confused about why are they still maintaining this behavior if we're the only threat and we're not really out there just killing them. Like, haven't they been habituated at this point? And so that was kind of the impetus for me looking into it. It's very curious about that behavior. Okay, two more questions. One, thank you. Um, one is, when we look at species of birds, for example, this is going back to mm -hmm. earlier work, um, 
you know, there, there's there's this thing of like, you know, what are the species? So I think of like urban, we always call starlings. When I, I took a bird class years ago in college and then we called them McDonald's parking lot birds. <laughs> and that was like what my instructor like said was like, oh, the starlings, McDonald's parking lot birds. So I'm wondering if, you know, you talked about a number of species and you might also see a cardinal or a blue mm-hmm. jay or something. But this whole idea of the type of species that you get in the urban and being less desirable, kind of. And did you see anything in terms of, I know you were talking about numbers of species, but what, or like type, number of different species, but Mm -hmm. what about within those species, the number of individuals? Because I would think that at least in my, I see all these starlings and I don't really see that much else. Mm -hmm. I don't know, did you get into that part of it? Yeah, so um, that was the slide that had the multiple graphs and it was the different trait values. Um, That was as close as I came to that type of analysis, uh, mostly because, yes, there are a number of species that are shared between D.C., Pittsburgh, and Minneapolis, but the communities are different enough that it was tough to do that because we don't all have the same number of species, so the model, you'd really lose a lot of data doing just the single species analysis of it. Um, So I instead opted to do that kind of life history trait approach with larger than average range or smaller than average range, Um, but it would be really interesting to see to go back and do that at the more species level approach, because you're right, there are some species that do really well in urban areas and, and are very abundant in other species that just don't. And my last question is, what is the take home message? So if I was to go to my neighbors that have outdoor cats that I hate, mm-hmm. sorry, <laughs> I said that out loud. Um, what is what, 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 would you, what would you say for me to say to them? Yeah, that's a great question uh, because cats are a very emotional situation. It's not something you can use with logic, especially somebody who's very attached to their cats and they put them out. Uh, you can tell them all day long you're hurting wildlife and it just doesn't penetrate. You know, they don't care. Um, and it's also not, you don't want to be accusatory and go in there and say, you're doing everything wrong. They're just going to shut down and they're not going to listen to you. I think a much more effective approach is to come at it with a lens of compassion and say something like, hey, I saw your cat almost get hit by a car yesterday and I'm really concerned about its well-being. Could you please maybe consider keeping it inside? You know, I, I don't want to personally see your cat splattered on my driveway and I'm just worried that that's going to be what happens if it stays out. <laughs> something along those lines. Okay, so no blame could go from the... Be compassionate, from... not compassionate confrontational. Yes. Yeah. I will add to that, that the paper, that paper with, this, with the cat little thing in the spatial map, HRA is like a pack of passion. HRA was our collaborator, it's like, it's like an animal compassion group. And so that paper, if you read that paper, it is very framed in like, cats kill wildlife, but also your cat is in danger from raccoons and things like that. So it's very framed in this way. So you should maybe read that paper and see how we sort of frame it both, on both sides of the issue when we were making recommendations. What dad was making. Also, I didn't add, but Dan is an illustrator and science communicator. And if you go to his website there, he has some clever little anonymous postcards about your cat being indoor that you can buy and leave <laughs> on doorsteps. <laughs> True. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have a, a tight time to come out of the room, so uh, we'll meet over in the, in the grad office following this, and you can ask Dan some more questions. Uh, let's get to that.